So it's that time of year again. Samsung set to push out their flagship phone, the Galaxy S4, on the 14th of March. But this year's launch is different. A lot of pressure hangs on the release of this device, much more so than previous years. And the reason? With the iPhone 5 slowly but surely falling out of the picture until its next iteration, the top mobile space is now up for grabs. HTC are making their move, pouring their heart and soul into the HTC One, and Sony is putting all of their weight behind the Xperia Z. The mid-2013 top smartphone slot means big money. In this video, I'll be bringing you all the details and juicy content. With the rumoured specs of the Galaxy S4, we may be able to speculate what the Note 3 may possess. So let's find out what's in store, shall we? In this video, we're mainly going to be concentrating on the Galaxy S4's hardware, because all that's known about the software is it's going to be Android 4.2 Jelly Bean. So the first thing that you guys are going to want to know is how does this device actually look like? That's the question on everyone's lips. So let's go along and have a look at some of the leaked pictures that are floating around the internet of the Samsung Galaxy S4. So these are the latest pictures and they all seem quite consistent. So for some of the you spec people out there, let's go over some of the specifications of this phone before we get to some of the more interesting things about the device. Let's start with the dimensions. Rumours say the Galaxy S4 is going to be 140.1mm tall, 71.8mm wide and 7.7mm thick. So that's quite thin actually. Rumours also say the device is going to be 138 grams light, feature a 13 megapixel camera at the back, a regular home button with your normal touch capacitive buttons, a plastic back with aluminium sides, the regular removable battery and come in two colours, black or white. So what do you know about the screen? Well, word is the screen is going to be a 4.99 inch, or basically 5 inch, full HD Solux display. So this is not AMOLED. So uh, it seems that Samsung is also having problems producing the quantities that they need for 1080p AMOLED screens. Here's a very interesting interview with the director of product marketing for Samsung Mobile. He says some things that allude to the fact that 1080p AMOLED screens will not be in the Samsung Galaxy S4. Let's take a look. Has Samsung been able to perfect a, a 1080p, you know, 5 inch to 4.8 inch AMOLED display, non pentile matrix? Okay, so here's what I will say about that. So, <laughs> come on, I'm just a good Here's what I will say yeah. about that. I'm ready. And this is where I skirt the question yeah, and okay. redirect. No, no, just come on. no, so if you think about what we've done on display technology, yeah. right? So we've continued to deliver super AMOLED displays. Blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So we started with, if you think back to Galaxy S2, yeah. it was our first Super AMOLED Plus, yeah. uh, probably WVGA at the yeah, time. Really at the Note uh, 2, yeah. we delivered 720p Super AMOLED. Yeah. Not necessarily Stripe, but non-pentile. Non-pentile display. So up. these things continue to evolve. Yeah. And as you know, we continue to remain at the forefront of display technology. And there are a number of devices being delivered today with 1080p and all of that kind of stuff. I, I, I would expect us to continue to be successful and competitive in the market. There will be a 1080p AMOLED display in the Galaxy S4 and the Galaxy Note 3. Okay, big other question. Just Wait for it. Here, I didn't say that. You said that. I'm all saying that. They will remain competitive. They will remain competitive. And in order for them to do that, they have to release at least the equivalent resolution, thereby through reductive analysis, one can interpret. Anyway, I'll stop. He didn't look too impressed at the end there, so it kind of seems they were shying away from the question and there's probably not going to be 1080p AMOLED screens inside the Galaxy S4. There's also word that there's going to be 16, 32 and 64 gigabytes available, with 2 gigabytes of RAM as standard. Alright, so let's get to the juicy stuff, the CPU and GPU. The Galaxy S4 was previously believed to come with an Exynos 5440 processor, also known as the Exynos 5 Octa-Core clocked at 1.4 GHz. However, the most recent reports from South Korea are saying something rather unsettling. The engineers over there are struggling to deal with overheating and power efficiency issues when utilizing the Exynos 5 processor. Because of this, Samsung may do something pretty interesting. They may have to settle for the Qualcomm Snapdragon 600 processor, clocked at 1.9 GHz. To give you an idea, the HTC One is using a 1.7 GHz version of this very same processor. This was a bit of a shock for most people, so it'll be interesting to see how investors react to this news. 
Okay, so let's learn a little bit about each of these processors. But the Galaxy S4 wouldn't even be using the Exynos processor, so why should we learn about both of them? I hear you screaming at the screen. Well, the Exynos processor, the 5440, might actually end up inside the Note 3, so it's worth learning about both of them. So let's start with the Exynos 5 Octa. So the main selling point of the Exynos 5 is its 8 core layout. I'll try and be brief in my explanation here, but basically the Exynos 5 Octa uses big little technology. It consists of four high-powered A15 cores, hence the word big, and four low-power A7 cores, hence the word little. The chip has an intelligent way of managing the way tasks are split between the high and low-powered cores. For example, for light tasks such as music playback and standard definition video playback, the four low-power cores will be used, but as soon as more power is needed, say to launch a web page or do some HD gaming, the high-power cores will kick in. Let's hear some more. Um, the system right now is running a stock Android ICS. It has a recent Linux kernel with modifications to support the big little architecture. Right now, as you can see here, uh, the ICS system is idling. There's almost no load on the little cores. And uh, there's only load right now on CPU 1, on one of the Cortex-A15. And that's because of the little screen animation here, the uh, green dots flying to the center of the screen, rendering tasks are high demanding tasks and they end up in the do uh, kernel domain of the uh, Cortex-A15s of the big cores. A music workload. This audio tool uh, creates tasks uh, which are running on the little cores. That means the load characteristics of those tasks um, are such that the MP schedule decides to put them into the um, scheduling domain of the Cortex-A7s. And another thing is important, uh, the load on the A15 stopped and that's because uh, the audio tool is in foreground so there is no um, animation going on right now on the screen, that's why uh, right now, both Cortex-A15s are idle. So basically you're saying, as long as that animation was running on the home screen, animation is considered a high-powered task, so the system decides to delegate that to the A15 cores. But as soon as he switches over to music playback, it's considered a low-powered task, so the system automatically switches over to the low-powered cores. So if you look carefully in the background here, you'll be able to see that as he's loading the web page, the A15s kick in, just to get that web page loading fast, and then as soon as it's done, they kick back to idle. Of course, this isn't the first time I've seen the big little concept. The Tegra 3 chipset included the same kind of idea, except it wasn't perfected because the devices using the chipsets all suffered from Metacore battery life, especially the phones. To learn more about big little technology, the full video will be in the description. All right, I'm trying pretty hard not to put the non-technical people to sleep, but um, it gets pretty technical when you start talking about chipsets, but a lot of people are into it, so anyway. So we'll take a short break and then we'll be back with the Qualcomm chipset after this. Welcome back guys, hopefully you're not asleep. And for the people that are interested in this, let's keep going. So, the Qualcomm Snapdragon 600 is a lot easier to explain than the uh, Exynos Octa-Core. It's basically just a normal quad-core chipset that offers 40% more power or a 40% speed increase over the S4 Pro used in the Nexus 4 and the Droid DNA. But that seems pretty ridiculous, right? I mean, the Droid DNA and uh, Nexus 4 have just been released. So it kind of shows how fast technology is moving at the moment. So if the Samsung Galaxy S4 does include the Snapdragon 600, it actually puts the device behind the curve instantly. It's said that the Tegra 4 has been benchmarked and actually beats the Snapdragon 600. And Qualcomm already have a Snapdragon 800, and ZTE announced their Grand Mimo that actually includes this chipset. The Snapdragon 800 is said to have a 75% CPU performance increase and double the graphics performance increase over the S4 Pro. This is because it uses Crate 400 CPUs at up to 2.3 GHz each. All of this information should be taken with a grain of salt because there has also been some recent news saying that the Exynos chipset may end up in the International Galaxy S4 while the US version gets the Qualcomm chipset. So what do you guys think about all of this? Which chipset would you rather inside the Galaxy S4? And what do you think of the rest of the specs? Would you be happy if all of what I'd said was indeed what was in the final product of the Galaxy S4? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Anyway, thanks for watching the whole way through. This has been Cold Fusion, and I'll see you next time.
Don't forget to rate, comment and subscribe. It's good to be back.